So energy, notice it's a gravitational potential energy. Back in the old days, like, you know, January, it was MGH. And the higher you raised an object, the greater the potential energy, yes? Well, that's not gonna be true. I mean, well, the equation MGH is not gonna work for objects that go far, far, far away, okay? And so I have this example, there's a graph on the next page. And so hopefully the combination of the two will help you see that we can't use MGH for every single situation. That's only true for near range distances. And the ground is zero. Now take a look at our new equation. Wait a second, doesn't that look familiar? Isn't that the force equation? What's the difference? GMM over R's not squared. So what happened here? Well, first of all, if you look at our example, imagine you have an imaginary worker. So in other words, they don't have mass themselves. And I guess they're gonna move the moon, okay? Further from the earth. And so they're gonna push the moon to the rightish outward distance, right? So they're gonna be doing positive work on the moon. Y'all remember work, force times distance, they gotta be parallel, cosine theta, when you're outward, outward, that would be zero degrees. So they're doing positive work. Well, what about gravity? Gravity is pulling inward on that mass, that moon. But that's 180 degrees, outward, inward. And so cosine 180, what kind of work is gravity doing as the person moves it further? That would be a negative work done by gravity. Y'all remember doing work? Now, each of these forces times distance, so we can take a look at uh, the work done by gravity would be the force of gravity times that distance. Well, force of gravity is now a big G, M1, M2 over R squared. And then I got to multiply by another distance and that distance is basically R again. What happens? R divided by R squared. One set cancels, okay? And so that's how we end up with the gravitational potential energy is equal to a negative big G, M1, M2 divided by R, okay? Now there's one more clarifier with this one and it talks about it there at, maybe it's the next slide, but imagine this worker goes out, 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 far, far, far away so much that gravity reaches a zero effect, okay? And so gravitation, if you go really far, imagine what this equation says. If I take it far away, R increases. Well, we know potential energy should increase, yes? As R gets bigger, potential energy gets bigger. But based on this equation, does it? R's in the denominator. When you have a bigger denominator, what happens to UG? It decreases unless we focus on that negative piece. Okay, so this negative piece is not a vector. We are not saying that potential energy is a vector. It's going to be a magnitude. And so magnitude. And so we still want the higher you raise it, the more potential energy you get. So, you know, we still want that to be true. But here's the difference. Let me switch over to the graph. So on the next page, sorry about that. Look at this graph on the next page. Is it our traditional quadrant one back whenever we had MGH? No, this is a quadrant four type of graph. So what's unique about quadrant four is we're gonna start with a negative 
maximum number, if you will, of potential energy. And then as you move the object far away, and that may be hard to tell right there, but your maximum distance is called infinity. Can we measure infinity? No. And you can tell this shape of the graph, you're gonna approach zero potential energy, but never really achieve it, right? Unless we just go with the concept, it goes so far away, it's at infinity, gravity is reaching a zero. And so how do we read this one now? Gravitational potential energy increases to zero as R increases. That shows a direct relationship. As R goes up, potential energy should go up, but being in the denominator, it feels a little weird. So that negative is the focus. You're gonna increase to zero. Little different, because it kind of makes sense. Potential energy starts at the surface of Earth with a negative magnitude, and it's going to increase to zero at infinity, far, far away. Okay? And so MGH is only used for objects near the surface of the Earth. Our new equation, the big G energy equation, is used for objects that are going to infinity. Okay. I think there was one more slide on page three. Let me check. Oh, it's the explanation of what we already said. Uh -huh. Good question. They don't have like a set distance that says if you're below this distance near, if you're beyond this distance far, um, at the end of the day, you know, we just said Mount Everest, really not much difference. But I would think if you, you know, went out of the Earth's atmosphere, you're going to probably not experience 9.8 to a significant amount. And so at the end of the day, by the way, you can always use big G MM over R, even at the surface of Earth. You're still going to equate to 9.8. Okay. Okay, so this page just kind of talks about what we said. You've got the near, you've got the far, two equations applied, and that negative piece is talking about the maximum value being zero at infinity, okay? Okay, so let's do a calculation. So back on page four, it's actually that escape speed that we talked about previous. And so the escape speed is actually a launch speed. It's the speed that you want to launch something in order for it to escape the Earth's gravitational field. And so if you think about, you know, your least favorite food, I don't know what I would say, um, tuna. I don't like tuna, at least from a can. Anyway, maybe, maybe a different, I know, I know, you work at a seafood place. I don't like tuna from a can, okay? I don't like it. Or, you know, hard boiled eggs. What if we put those in a spaceship, launched them at this escape speed so that they went away and never came back, okay? Well, forces is not gonna actually do it for us. We're gonna use conservation of energy. Remember, no net external forces acting on the system. Mechanical energy is conserved. And so when you're at, let me draw a little picture here on the side. When we're at, so this is V initial, this is the escape speed. When we're at the surface of the earth, you have a initial maximum kinetic energy. Well, we also have a potential energy now, but you've got to remember it's a maximum negative. So I'll plug that negative equation in here in a little bit, but it's going to be basically a maximum negative equals well, y'all, the same thing is true. As our rocket goes up, 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 what happens to the speed? Uh-uh. It goes down, right? It slows down as it goes up, 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 up. Remember, we talked about slow into a stop. It's just now, where does it come to a stop? So minimum 
at infinity, okay? And then plus that final gravitational potential energy at infinity. And it's a maximum here. So over here is the minimum, but it's gonna be a negative value. And so how are we gonna solve this? Well, minimum uh, kinetic final is gonna be, well, let's say it comes to a split second stop at that border and it just doesn't ever fall back down. And then potential energy, let me do a different color there. Potential energy at infinity is gonna be zero. Remember you're increasing to zero. And so plug in the equations. We got one half. M, this is our small mass, whatever you're launching, not the Earth's mass. And then this escape velocity squared, one half mv squared, plus a negative, and here's our new equation. Remember, it's not r squared, and it all equals zero. And so here we can actually add that g m m over r to the other side. And notice what happens. Which m cancels? The small mass. And what are we solving for? The speed. Solve for the escape speed. So we got to multiply both sides by two and then take the square root. And if you're like, that looks familiar, didn't we already do this? It's very similar to the orbital speed where we got square root of g m2 over r. They differ by a factor of square root two. Good deal? Yeah. So when you throw something up, and it increases in potential energy, the kinetic energy decreases. And so if you're going to the extremes, it's gonna decrease all the way to zero. Up, 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 split second stop, except now we're at infinity. So we gotta have a super big velocity launch speed so that we can get it there and leave the Earth's gravitational field. Does that help? Yes. It's gonna what? It's increasing towards zero now. So once you're like out of the gravitational Yeah, yeah, at infinity, right? Which we don't really have a number for, but at that super duper far distance away, it finally will reach a potential energy of zero, a max of zero. So just with this new big G potential energy, think about quadrant four. Just envision quadrant four. You're still increasing potential, but it's increasing to zero. It's the only way it all works. Good deal? Okay, let's see what we have next. Okay, so there's a, a multiple choice problem uh, related to energy. It's a rocket firing. And so uh, see if y'all can work this one out and pick your best answer. We got an answer. So triple column, right? We got to figure out what's happening with the kinetic energy, the new gravitational potential energy and the system's mechanical energy. Well, first of all, overall mechanical energy, how do we know if it's increasing, decreasing or staying constant? What's well, about that net external work, right? As the rocket fires its engine, and goes away from Earth, has an ascent, what's gonna be true? Is there any net external forces acting on it? No, okay, neglecting air resistance, right? And so we can say constant here. 
And then notice both of those line up with system gravitational potential energy is increasing. Does that make sense that it's increasing? Increasing, oh, wrong one. Come on. It's increasing to zero. So again, quadrant four. And then what's happening to the kinetic energy as it ascends? Decreasing. So final answer is D. Good deal? All right. Questions on the new gravitational potential energy? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Why is kinetic energy decreasing? Well, if potential energy increases and your total has to remain constant, as one goes up, the other has to go down, right? So yes, it launched at a high speed and they're still maybe firing, but the overall effects of gravity and such, it's still gonna decrease its kinetic energy. Yes. Well, that would be an internal. The rocket firing would be internal to the system, right? Huh? Air resistance. And so air resistance, you they don't mention it. The AP rule of thumb is you neglect it unless told otherwise. So air resistance drag um, is actually pretty important to rockets, uh, but here neglected. Okay. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears. The last big ideas to talk about are Kepler's laws. Kepler, not Newton, right? We got three Kepler laws. Now, one of them has math, two of them are concepts. Um, I guess one of the concept ones does relate to math. Anyway, so first law, this is just kind of setting the stage for the others. It's talking about planets going around the sun. And so planets going around the sun have an elliptical orbit, yes? And so it talks about one focus. And so the sun, notice, is at one of the focal points for this ellipse. And so the planet, it shows, you go, it shows going around the sun, but the sun is at one of the focal points. That's pretty much it. They're just setting a stage, okay? And then on page five, yeah, moving on, that was it. And so on page five, we get to the second law. Now I used to have an animation for this. Uh, maybe I try and find that for next time because I don't have the PowerPoint pulled up right now. But it says second law, as a planet moves in its orbit, a line drawn from the sun to the planet. So you can see that in maybe here, sun to part one, point one, it's gonna sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. So when it's close to the focal point, when the planet is close to the sun, okay, the sun is still at F1. And so this area that it sweeps, it's close, that's a small radius, is it gonna have a high speed or low speed? It'll have a high speed. And so you get a, what appears to be greater area because of the circumference there, you get a bigger arc length and time has to be equal when you compare it to the three, four. So from three, four, you have a greater distance apart. And so it's gonna be traveling at what speed? a slower speed. And so it still has the same time interval if the areas are equal, okay? Basically this, this speed changing with the R changing, y'all this one, it has a conservation of angular momentum applied here. So if you think about the planet as a point mass, wasn't too long ago, angular momentum for a point mass, L equals MV R perp. And so M, and I'm gonna say initial, and then the distance initial, mass does not change. And so if mom angular momentum is 
conserve, then mass actually would cancel out here. But there you can see the inverse relationship between the speed of the planet when it's at different points in the orbit. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, the animation's on the next slide, but one note doesn't animate, but imagine that is animated. Okay, so as it goes around those equal areas happen in the equal amounts of time. And it talks about closest, it's moving the fastest, and then furthest, it's moving the slowest. The third law is where we're gonna spend some time with. And so here is Kepler's third law. It relates the distance R to the period. And you'll see that period is squared, R is cubed. We kind of already got there, okay? So we'll derive it. This Kepler's third law is the same for all planets that orbit the sun. It doesn't matter which one, it's true for all. And so this is really about planets orbiting around the sun. I think the slide to the right is gonna have us derive it. So keep this one in mind. Derive Kepler's third law from using Newton's uh, law of gravitation or new one. For planet one, we have a mass of one and the sun we'll say is mass of sun. And so if we look at just that one sweeping area, yes, it's an elliptical overall, but we can use the net force equals of the planet equals the gravitational force between the planet and the sun. And so once again, that MAC, and this is the planet's mass, equals big G, mass planet, mass sun, over R, is it squared or not squared for the force? It's squared. So no when to square and not to square. Well, we got to get it to period. You've already seen that it's period based. And so I'm going to put um, acceleration, I'll, let's do it on the side here, is that V squared over R. V is the circumference over period. And so it's going to be that 2 pi R over period, all squared. And so if we write it as 4 pi squared, R squared over T squared, all over R, What's gonna happen here? Well, we've got R over one, and then we multiply by the reciprocal. I'll have R squared over R, one set cancels. And so centripetal acceleration is four pi squared times R over period squared. And if you're like, shouldn't it be cubed? Wait for it. And so I can bring that over here on the left-hand side. Oh, and let's go on and do it. Mass of planet, both sides, what happens? It cancels. And so I'm gonna plug in four pi squared times R over period squared equals G MS over R squared. And so how we get the other piece is grouping all the things that are constant, no matter what planet you're looking at. Isn't the mass of the sun constant? Isn't G constant? Isn't pi squared constant? Isn't four constant? And so let's group the constants and it doesn't matter which way we go. So I think let's multiply both sides by R squared. Now, when you multiply the left-hand side by R squared, what do we get? R cubed over T squared, and then divide both sides by four pi squared. And so these are all your constants grouped together. And so you see that cubed radius over T squared. Well, what if we apply this from one planet to the next? If they all equal that set of constants, then we can say, I'm running out of room. Oh, I guess we can K 
carry it over to the other slide where it was. And so we got r cubed over t squared equals all those constants. Well, just slap a subscript. If it's for one planet equaling those constants, can't we say it equals that of a second planet? And then all that Kepler's law is showing is they grouped the period, they grouped the radii, cross multiply, okay? Either format should be the same thing. Good deal? Okay, so how do we apply this? I think on the right-hand side, we've got an uh, example. It says the mean distance, mean means what? Average. So the average distance from the earth to the sun is 1.496 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. What should we do? Kilo times 10 to the? Uh-oh. Third, okay, so really that distance from the earth to the sun is going to be 1.496 times 10 to the eighth times 10 to the third. What's another way of writing that? Whenever you add the exponents, we get, or times, we get to the 11th. And that's in meters. And it says the period is one year which we, and I think we can keep it in terms of year with Kepler's law because we don't really calculate, uh, you know, a Newton's or anything. The period of Jupiter and the sun is, they tell us, 11.86 years. Determine the mean distance from the sun to Jupiter. And so using Kepler's law, we know it's that ratio of R cubed to T squared and so r cubed of one, t squared of one, and we can make them earth. And then radius of Jupiter cubed to period of Jupiter squared. Just make sure it's the radius that's cubed, not period. And so plug in what we know. And so radius, 1.496 times 10 to the 11th cubed over one squared equals the radius of Jupiter. By the way, we'll have to do a cube root. Now we know how. And the period, 11.86, don't forget to square. And so let's cube and square and multiply and cube root. Answer cubed times 11.86 squared. And then we'll have to cube root that answer. So I get, let me know if you get something different, 7.78 times 10 to the 11th. And that would be in meters. So actually, we could have kept it in kilometers. As long as they're both in terms of kilometers, that should have been okay. I went ahead and converted one, not the other. Oh, well. Did y'all get that same answer? It's bigger than that of Earth, which it should be, right? It's further. Questions on the Kepler laws. Kepler 1, uh, first law is just about identifying the sun as one of the focal points of the ellipse. Two, has that connection with angular momentum that when it's close to the sun, it speeds up, and when it's far, it slows down, and that it has the equal area in equal time. Third law is that cube radius and T squared ratio is constant for all the planets orbiting around the sun. Good deal?